Um, hi, everyone. So thank you for joining us today, the people in, in person in, in the room at CS and the people remote through our links. Uh, so this is this is the, um, uh, the first, the opening talk of um, uh, our Mind in Vitro series that we have resumed since last year. And now it's been a great upgrade to be a distinguished lecture, actually. And so, okay, you are our first distinguished um, lecturer here. Um, and, um, and so it is a great pleasure uh, for me today to uh, introduce O.K. Ispert uh, from EPFL in, in Zurich. So O.K.'s okay, background is in physics. So he's a physicist uh, who studied at, at EPFL, uh, moved on for a PhD in um, uh, computational neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh. And after that, had a postdoc again in Switzerland, EPFL and ITSIA, which is another institute in Switzerland, and subsequently to the University of South uh, um, California, um, where, where he continued to, uh, and, and he stayed there as a research assistant professor before eventually moving back to EPFL uh, again as, a, as an assistant professor, where he is now uh, a full professor. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, OK's interest lie at the intersection of robotics, dynamics, control, and computational neuroscience. He has been enormously successful, routinely published in Nature Science and so on paper. Uh, many of you uh, must have come across uh, uh, some, of his, uh, some of his work. Um, one thing that I particularly appreciate of OK's work is um, uh, the, the fact that every paper is not necessarily a demonstration that the robot can be built, which is of course very valuable from an engineering uh, standpoint, but it carries a deeper message or a deeper lessons about the living world. And that's something that I, I particularly enjoy. And that of course um, is uh, particularly well suited or well or in line with uh, the mind in vitro program where we in fact use components from the living world to carry out uh, tasks related to robotics control and more broadly um, intelligence. So uh, without any further ado, I would like, uh, you know, please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, OK. Um, and uh, we cannot, well, someone might, <laughs> I, I'm clapping on camera <laughs> like this. Um, and um, well, the floor is yours. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mattia. And I, I feel really bad I'm not there in person. I would love to visit the center. It looks amazing. So thank you so much to you, uh, Mattia and Nancy, for inviting me. I, I'll do my best to be entertaining and interesting uh, remotely. Uh, and I'm based in Lausanne, uh, not in Zurich. We are the, the sister institute. EPFL is, is in the oh, French part. Did I part. say Zurich? Yeah, yeah, you said Zurich, but that's oh, your your own sorry, background sorry, from Zurich. EPFL, of course, is Lausanne. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know it very well because you were yeah, in Zurich. I, I know that. And, and by the way, I have this very complex Dutch name, Auke Eisbeet, but I, I was born in Geneva, so I speak better French than, than Dutch. And, and you probably see it from my French accent when, I, when I'll speak. Hmm. Great. So, yeah, thanks so much. I, I was thinking to give a talk about locomotion. So, I'm, I'm a roboticist and a computational neuroscientist, and I, I love locomotion. So I thought I would show a bit what we can do in terms of using robots and numerical models to study animal locomotion. First, starting a bit with lower vertebrates, then show a bit rec more recent work on, on human locomotion. If Then I will show a bit how we can add learning on top of, of uh, the spinal cord dynamics. And if I have time, I, I will show a bit some projects we do on paleontology robotics. I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure if we'll have enough time for that, but let's, let's see. So yeah, let's go back to locomotion. So animal locomotion, and the more I do robotics, the more I'm really impressed by animals. So if you look at this dog running, its nervous system is solving a very complex control problem. It's high dimensional, uh, it's highly nonlinear. The relationship between the muscle activation and forward movement is highly nonlinear. Uh, it's a hybrid problem with contacts changing all the time. And it's really impressive how good animals are at doing uh, locomotion. And that's just steady state. So um, non-steady state like this for these agility competitions are even more impressive, I think. And here you have multiple sensor modalities that are used by the animal to keep balance, to move around and, and, and follow a, a path. And it's really beautiful how, how good locomotion is. 
And when you think about it, this is done with very slow components. So neurons transmit at maximum 100 meters per second, uh, electric signals, which is several orders of magnitude slower than, than uh, the electronic circuits in, in robots. So it's, it's really impressive how good um, uh, we are at doing locomotion. And at first glance, I would say there are four main components. There's the musculoskeletal system. The body is already well designed to do locomotion. Then the spinal cord is super interesting. So the spinal cord has obviously reflexes, multiple feedback loops, and this very interesting concept of central pattern generators. So these are population of neurons that oscillate, and, and there are many oscillators all along the spinal cord. And they are like, like feed forward a bit controllers in the spinal cord to produce rhythmic patterns. And then you have, of course, the high part of the brain that will modulate these signals to, to achieve the agility that we have seen. So in the second movie that we have seen, there's probably a lot of activation and multiple descending pathways being activated. But for steady state, it's very much the spinal cord that's really uh, mainly in charge. So for steady state, you can do everything just with the spinal cord. And, and, and we should not under estimate to what extent the spinal cord is, is impressive. So in my lab, we, are, we like to understand how these components inter interact and, and see a bit from a robotics perspective, how do they interact and communicate? What are the time delays? How, how is this organized? And here I think nature has found a very clever way of dealing with time delay. So by relying a lot on the spinal cord, having feedback loops with reflexes that are as with uh, through as few synapses as possible. Then, as mentioned, the, the CPGs are an interesting concept, like a, a feed forward controller at the low level. And then obviously you have the high part which will modulate this using internal models. And there you also have feedback and feed forward loops. And I think a robotics perspective and modeling can be useful to investigate how this works together. And now one image I like a lot is one proposed by Jerry Lubb is from USC, who sees the spinal cord as a system, uh, a, a puppet on strings. We're playing with a limited set of strings. You can modulate quite complex behavior. And I think it's a very good uh, illustration or at least uh, image of what happens. A uh, finite set of descending pathways and very complex behavior at the output level. Now, these are the main components, but it looks like that during evolution, the more locomotion became unstable, it's likely that the respective roles of these different components ha have changed. So um, if you look here, um, let me check, sorry, let me check the pointer, no, here. If you look at, um, here, this is a respective role of uh, each of these components, like the reflexes, central pattern generators, and descending modulation. The more locomotion became unstable, um, the, the more, uh, at the beginning, we could rely a lot on, on CPGs to be feed forward, and the more we become unstable, the more we need sensory feedback and descending modulation. So this is a hypothesis that we have with Monica Daly uh, in the paper below, and we want to use models to test uh, if this hypothesis is correct. And here, one of my favorite animals is the salamander. The salamander is, is really beautiful. It's an amphibian, so it's a very old animal, which can swim like eels or lamprey. And if you place the salamander on ground, it will switch to a, a walking trot gait, a quite different gait uh, uh, on, on ground. And what's interesting, if you do electrical stimulation of the, the spinal cord, at low level of stimulation, you'll see the walking gait, as you see on the right. If you increase a bit the stimulation, the, the rhythm will go faster. And if you pass a threshold, the limbs fold and you switch to swimming. And this is quite incredible. Just changing the drive, just one string, one descending pathway can completely modulate the type of gait in, in this animal. So this is something I've been studying for quite some time and always found fascinating. And therefore, we, with colleagues, we have tried to model the circuits in the spinal cord. At the beginning, we're focusing mainly on the central pattern generators, the, the scopal os oscillators. And then we have looked at how we could start from a swimming circuit and add new oscillatory centers for the limbs to be able to do this transition from swimming to, to walking. 
Um, we have made multiple models of this, and, and one of, of my favorites are very simple coupled oscillators mo models, like uh, people call them Kuramoto oscillators, uh, or the uh, yeah, same type of oscillator that Nancy Koppel and Bart Emmentrout have used for the LAMP preferences. So very simple building blocks, but once you start to couple them together, change a bit the intrinsic frequencies, properties, and, and some additional things about amplitude of, of oscillations, these are very good building blocks to test the hypothesis that we have. Now, since this is a bit older work, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but let me show you what we could demonstrate. So here is our amphibious uh, salam salamander-like robot, which is completely controlled by a spinal cord model, this couple of oscillators uh, uh, that are implemented on board of the computer, uh, on the onboard computer. And what's interesting is the only thing we do is modulate two descending drives here. And with two descending signals, we can completely change the, the type of gate. Like now you see walking, it's like low drive mode. And with a remote control, we'll now increase the drive and you see this beautiful transition to swimming. So just changing the global drive will make a complete change from swimming to walking and vice versa. If we stimulate more one side of the spinal cord, we, can, we induce turning. And within the frequency range of swimming and, and walking, we can go faster and, and slower. So one take home message here is that CPGs are really beautiful circuits that can really very nicely modulate many things of locomotion with very simple inputs and then produce all this coordination as like a feed forward pattern. All right, so that, that was one contribution demonstrating a bit the beauty of central pattern generators. But what's interesting here, what you see is, is done open loop in the sense that the CPG, except for the descending drive, they don't receive any sensory feedback from the body. And that's obviously a, a very bit, big simplification. And nowadays we study a lot this beautiful interplay that exists between sensory driven oscillations and CPG driven oscillations. So this is a, a very nice conceptual paper by Art Kuo uh, in 2002. He showed that if you take a pendulum, a simulated pendulum driven by muscles and, and have simple neurons, on the left you could make limit cycle behavior with sensory feedback, so rhythms through feedback. And on the right you can make um, oscillations based on, on CPGs here. And more or less the same limit cycle can be generated by both. But the more robust is when you do, you combine feedback and, and CPGs. But this is a very old debate. So uh, already 400 years ago, people were saying we should see locomotion more as a chain of reflexes, like Sherrington. Or Graham Brown, his PhD student, he was proposing more this concept of CPGs or half centers. He was seeing locomotion as a bit more feed forward driven. And it's a, it's a question of, is it more the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system? Or is this trade-off between feedback or feed-forward control that from roboticists we, we know is an important trade-off? Now to study question, the question of what's the optimal way of combining these two, you need the body, of course. The body is how they communicate. And here I think robotics can play a role to show the, the importance of embodiment and here, I'm a big fan of all the work on passive or dynamic workers, like here from the work of Steve Collins and uh, Martin Viss and Andy Runa, showing how just a mechanical device without any brain, without motors, without anything, just a bit of gravity, can do locomotion in principle. So just the biomechanics can already do some kind of locomotion. And here on the right, this is a, a, a trout swimming behind a half cylinder that creates a, a set of uh, vortices, like a Kármán street of vortices. And here this trout can benefit from these vortices. But what's interesting, it's a dead trout. So it's a purely passive viscalistic system, just benefiting from the, the nice mechanical properties and from the water. And I find it's very important to highlight the embodiments, the importance of embodiment in, in locomotion. So therefore, we, we went back to go a bit deeper into this interplay between sensory feedback and central pattern generators. And we went back to lamprey or eel-like locomotion, just very simple anguilliform locomotion. 
And here what's interesting is that animals like eels are super impressive uh, in terms of robustness. Um, in the PhD thesis of Peter Wallen, he, he did in Stockholm long time ago, he showed that uh, eels have this concept of central pattern generators and, and spinal cord feedback loops. And he showed that if you do a transaction of the spinal cord at one level or another level, even two levels, uh, you still have coordinated swimming and, and almost intact looking locomotion. So you almost don't see a difference uh, before and after transaction, which is to be honest, super surprising because in most animals you, you become paraplegic or tetraplegic. Uh, even in salamanders, you, you cannot swim, but the eel can keep swimming despite a full transaction. And, and what's interesting is that the activity below the lesion stays synchronized with what happens above and, and, and if the animal will go faster, slower and stay synchronized. And I think this really nicely shows that there must be a feedback loop compensating for the missing communication. And this is exactly what we studied with some colleagues and, and within the lab is to see how feedback, different types of feedback could play a role in, in uh, swimming. And here what we did is, is create, again, the simple possible models that have all the components. So we have the local oscillator, we implemented as a couple, uh, like a phase oscillator. We have the coupling, like Kuramoto-like coupling, and we have local sensory feedback, very local, coming back directly to the local oscillators. And we, we in that paper, we explored pressure feedback, the pressure that animals, the sensors that animals have on the skin, and more recently, we're also exploring stretch. And in both cases, we, we have pretty good results of showing how sensory feedback can help uh, locomotion. So let me present you here Agnatax, uh, our swimming robot. And as you might notice, um, it has a little very primitive tactile skin, like little plates with load cells that will be an approximation of the tactile skin. And we, using the signals between left and right, we'll bring that into the local oscillators to see how it could help possibly to synchronize swimming. And here, I mean, the robot and the model, and we also have muscle models, by the way, I, I, I cannot go in details, but we have all the components there of locomotion. What's interesting is we can activate some and deactivate others to see the respective role of each. And for instance, what we can do is, is remove coupling like do an extreme case of the eel experiments where we remove all the couplings in, in the system, uh, meaning there's no direct communication anymore between oscillators. Everything will be indirect through the, the water. And here we were surprised in the sense that we got very nice synchronization thanks to sensory feedback. Now let me show you first a video where we don't have coupling, we don't have feedback, and there, obviously, with random initial conditions, there's no way these oscillators will synchronize and you see very bad swimming. Now, the video on the right, we still don't have coupling, but we now add the local feedback at every segment. And look what happens. So here, the very local feedback has a global effect, which is beautiful you see a beautiful emergent gate appearing and it's a very robust phenomena so from initial different initial conditions different frequencies you always nicely converge to this um, this nice swimming gate obviously we were hoping for some uh, synchronization but we, I, to be honest i was not expecting that the synchronization would systematically go to so good swimming so it, it really shows that sensory feedback could in principle really synchronize oscillators, these, these decoupled oscillators, and be an explanation of why eels can swim so well. We tried the same on the robot, so it, it doesn't work as well on the robot. It takes a bit more time to, to synchronize. The transient is a bit longer. But here again, you have a beautiful traveling wave emerging. And really think about it. These oscillators cannot communicate directly. They just feel the local difference of pressure between left and right. And that's the only signal that they have. And it's through the embodiment, the fluid, that they, they can then synchronize and lead to a beautiful traveling wave again. 
but I, again, I was there was a nice result for us. We we didn't expect so good swimming uh, based just on on sensory synchronization. All right, so sensory feedback can de synchronize decouple oscillators also on the robot. And now, if you add coupling on top of the sensory feedback, as we did as well, then you have very good swimming. So it's it synchronizes much more rapidly. Transients are very short, and and you have the the very nice swimming and that the eels has. Like the eels don't have this big transients of uh, for acceleration. They can accelerate directly, and that's probably due to these direct couplings. All right. So best swim with a combined configuration. And finally, what we also explored is if we do lesions in the system, if we lesion, for instance, we remove couplings or we remove sensors or we even kill oscillators, we could show that the combined network is the most robust one. I don't have time to go in detail, but just trust me, uh, just by combining the sensory and the peripheral mechanisms together, we have much more robust uh, swimming than any of these mechanisms alone. So that's probably why they coexist in the animal to have this amazing uh, robustness. All right, to summarize this part, so we, we could show, I think that CPGs are beautiful. They, they really like, generate beautiful, uh, fairly agile locomotion by themselves. Um, and what we also showed is that, uh, something that I personally underestimated is the beautiful role of sensory feedback to handle perturbation that I expected. I, I didn't cover that in this talk today, but. What I underestimated a bit is the beautiful role of sensory feedback in synchronizing oscillators and possibly in generating rhythms. I didn't have time to cover that in the talk, but we, even rhythms can be generated through feedback. And therefore, I think we, I, I love this kind of high flexibility of the network. And, and especially, I think we should see locomotion as a self-organized process where multiple uh, process mechanisms are acting together. And this leads, therefore, to this very high robustness and uh, big full tolerance. All right, so it's still working in progress. We're now adding more feed types of feedback. We also check if this works for the salamander and we start having still good results. So keep, keep, keep uh, an eye open on the next papers, but we, we have nice results coming. All right, so that, that was for lower vertebrates. Now, what about humans? Interestingly, we, we don't know much about the human spinal cord circuit. They, they're still very hard to access, very hard to measure and record while locomotion. And there's still a bit the debate in the field of how, how the interaction is, how takes place between central pattern generators and, and reflexes. And there's even a debate if there are CPGs or not used by, by uh, humans, but there's a lot of indirect evidence that humans have CPGs like any other animal. And um, if you want, there's this review paper that, that shows that a bit more. But um, many people have done beautiful work on, on modeling uh, the different components of human locomotion. And I, I would say among all the, the work that has been done, one of my favorite and models is the one that developed by Hartmut Geyer and uh, uh, Hartmut, uh, uh, you here, sorry, Hartmut Geyer and you here. They developed a beautiful model that was at the beginning in 2D. They simulated the muscles and they simulate a whole set of reflexes. They, see, they had also a very simple uh, control uh, for posture, very simple. And they didn't have any CPGs, no oscillators, just purely sensory driven locomotion. And a bit annoying for me because I'm a CPG person, they, they, they had very good be, uh, results. So they could really generate beautiful locomotion in the, in the sense of the kinematics being very close to human kinematics, uh, the ground reaction forces, even the simulated EMGs are very similar to human EMGs. So really, really good model. And um, they were nice enough to share it. So many people uh, reused it. And in my lab, since we are more coming from the CPG camp, we were thinking what would be the benefit to add the CPG on top of this circuit um, could we still win something, gain something by having a CPG on top of the sensory driven circuit? And quite rapidly, we came for, for several hypotheses of the usefulness of having oscillators on top of the feedback driven circuit. And the first one is the control of speed. 
because it's very hard to go fast or slower in the sensory-driven network. You need to change many reflex gains in a complex way. Also, the original model is quite fragile against sensory noise. It's very fragile against sensory failure, and it's very dependent on the initial conditions. Depending on how you start, you will never go into limit cycle behavior. So therefore, we, we wanted to fail first test this first hypothesis. What's the importance of CPGs possibly in controlling speed? And so what we did is we started from the, the sensory driven network and then in a bit an ad hoc fashion, we added a CPG on top of it, a CPG layer, which could generate rhythmic patterns which resemble the steady state signals of, from the sensory driven signals. And then we still have a few control buttons to modulate just the frequency and the amplitude of the oscillators. That's the only thing we will provide as input to try to modulate speed. And without going into much detail, but for every pair of muscles, we could either be uh, purely feed for driven uh, or purely feedback driven or in between to see a, a bit what is the optimal combination of feed forward and feedback control. And we did that exactly like Art Kuo did in his very nice pendulum paper I had mentioned before. And the question was to see pair by muscle by muscle or pair, pairs of muscle by pairs of muscle, what's the optimal combination of CPG and sensory feedback. Now, now we have many open parameters. We, we use particle swarm optimization to try to explore the space of possible gates. Uh, our fitness function was mainly trying to reach a desired speed that we could then vary and try to minimize energy. And what's quite striking to me is that in fairly low number of generations, like maybe 200 generations of the PSO algorithm, which is very fairly short, much much less than people would expect for a complex problem like locomotion, you generate very good looking gates as you see here um, at, at the bottom. And even what's also interesting for me, if you look at this guy here, um, it's not a good locomotion guy, but uh, it's quite natural looking, like it's maybe Mattia having too many beers. And, and uh, surprisingly realistic, just because the reflexes are there, the muscles are there. So something is, is already pretty good to do locomotion, even if it's not well tuned yet. All right, and so what we, at the end, what we could show is that indeed adding C, a CPG is super beneficial. Uh, then with a con single control button, we, we are able to modulate the, the frequency. So here now, this is a frequency parameter. We, we are decreasing it and you see a, a very smooth change of speed with a single button, something that's very hard to do with the sentry-driven model. Okay, so we could really show uh, simplified control of speed. And what's interesting is we could show that you don't need to add the oscillators everywhere. Uh, the most important point where you need to add them is at the hips. And um, the hips are, are the most important muscles uh, for the CPGs to be able to do the speed tuning. And this, I think, is interesting because uh, Monica Daly, with whom we recently wrote a, a review paper here at the bottom, she had come to the same conclusion by studying birds. Uh, so the fact she also, together we have this hypothesis now, is that we believe that the more proximal joints, the more, uh, yeah, the more like the hip muscles are more driven by CPGs. And the more you go distally away from the limb, at the end of the limb, like the ankles, the more you, you rely on feedback. This is kind of a hypothesis. Our first modeling supports this, but we, we still have to prove it a bit more. But basically, it's interesting to see this gradient even within the limb between the respective role of feed forward and feedback control. All right, so, so um, yeah, distal joints more sensory driven and proximal joints more CPG driven. Now, very rapidly, we, we now going into more details of the neural circuitry uh, behind this. So the first models were quite abstract. Now we go a bit deeper, especially in the reflex circuit to see how this works. And we, we find the same results, basically, uh, that uh, the sensory feedback is super important. But by adding the CPGs on top, you have a very simple way of controlling speed. 
with more realistic sensory feedback signals. And we're also finding that if you remove some parts, like uh, surprisingly, you can do fairly good locomotion without the, the balance controller. Uh, it, at some point, it will fall, but you can walk quite a bit. If you remove the CPGs, it doesn't work at all. So you, you, you don't go to the next step. So you really need a mechanism of, of, of going to the next step. Um, and in the original model, they had a little trick to do that. They, they did like a change of phase. Uh, but if you remove that, you need the CPGs, otherwise you don't get to good locomotion. And if you remove the feedback, you're also not stable. So um, here I would say both CPGs and, and, and feedback are, are super important uh, for generating uh, locomotion. Okay, so, so that supports a bit this idea of indeed um, uh, possibly smaller role of CPGs compared to sensory feedback, but still both are needed, I would say, to, to explain a bit uh, human locomotion. Now let's switch to the third project I mentioned. Um, this is a more recent project uh, where we're quite excited to see how, explore a bit how the high part of the brain can learn to use the spinal cord dynamics. And, and that's the big question. How, how can, can we, uh, humans or any animal, how can high parts of the brain learn and plan movements? while taking into account the, the spinal cord dynamics. And I think this is a quite fundamental question, in fact, because uh, when you think about it, the, the descending modulation signals here that communicate, uh, that are very important to plan and, and decide what you want to do, they don't have access directly to muscles. They, they go through the spinal cord dynamics. And this space here is very strange because some, some of these descending signals will activate oscillations. Other might change the offset of an oscillation. Other might increase the reflex gain or inhibit the reflex gain. So it's a very strange input space. It's not at all joint angle space, as you might think a bit naively. And so what we did with uh, Guillaume, a postdoc in the lab, is um, create again a very simple model that has a bit all the components. It has the, uh, it will have, it will use deep reinforcement learning to represent high part of the brain that will send the descending signals to the CPG network. Um, and, and, and then we can then modulate speed and, and uh, have body height and ground clearance. The CPG is modeled, again, in a very abstract way, a bit more complicated than the salamander network, but still fairly simple. We now do this with a, a legged robot that I'll show later. And we have different pathways of sensory streams. So uh, proprioceptive signaling, uh, vestibular signaling and, and more recently visual perception. And what's nice is, again, we, since we have all the building blocks, we can activate some, disactivate others. And especially you can address this question of what's happening here. What does high, how can the high part of the brain learn to use this, this complex network in the spinal cord? And here, what we use is, is use uh, deep reinforcement learning to, to, to learn, uh, train a policy that will be the high part of the brain. And what's interesting is we have a very simple reward function. So we try to, be, to follow uh, a design um, linear and rotational velocity, and we want to avoid rolling, and we want to do it with as little energy as possible. So basically three terms, a very simple reward. And while training, we want to be able to change the, all the speed signals. We want to be able to change the height of the body and uh, the ground clearance. And deep reinforcement learning is, is doing so well these days that it really learns this beautifully. So uh, you converge to beautiful controllers, being able to modulate gates in terms of speed, uh, direction, and uh, ground clearance. Here you see some examples. They all work uh, beautifully. So that, that was nice. And um, if, you, if you now look at um, what, how the gates look, so first of all, they look good in simulation, but they, they transfer very well to the real robot, uh, solving the sim to real transfer, as it's called. What's nice is that we can, with very simple uh, inputs, we can modulate things like uh, the, the body height, uh, something that's not always trivial to do with uh, all policies that you lose in, in deep reinforcement learning. We can modulate ground clearance, meaning how high you lift your, your limbs. And uh, yeah, this works on the robot. So everything works pretty good on, on the robot. It, it really modulates this nicely. 
So, and, and finally, what was also the good surprise is, is um, it's, it was surprisingly robust against perturbation. So uh, here it's a terrain that's a bit complicated, but uh, the robot rarely falls. And also if you add weight to the robot, it will also rarely fall. So it, it, um, it can even, you can double the weight of the robot and it will still do robust locomotion. So these are kind of properties that animals need to have as well. Is is you you don't know the environment, you don't know maybe your your mass property might change over time. So you want to be robust. Now the big hope that I had was to demonstrate that having a CPG in the loop would make would make learning much faster than directly accessing the motors. So I was super excited. I was very much hoping for having fast learning, and the answer is no. <laughs> so. It was very disappointing is um, you can do as fast learning in joint space directly than going through the spinal cord. And for me, it was a bit of disappointment. But the, the, the good news is the learning is somehow much easier in the, sen in the sense that we, the reward function that, we did, that I showed to you is, is very simple compared to traditional rewards in, in, in Lego robotics. So normally rewards have many more terms than just three terms. And um, for instance, just to as a control experiment, we, we, we tried this. We, we tried a policy that directly accesses motors, that completely bypasses the spinal cord, with otherwise exactly the same reward. And, and here is what you get. So you get very pathological gates, I would say. It, it, it has a good score, so it solves the problem in terms of reinforcement learning. But it's really not what you hope for a robot. This this would not converge. This would not work on the real platform, for instance. It's a very pathological gate. Why is that? Is because um, the CPGs were there to offer already good building blocks for movements that are now missing. So you you can learn very fast. Uh, you have a high reward, but you have to do a lot of reward tuning if you want to have a natural looking gate. So I would say at the end that's the main advantage of the, the CPGs is this notion of um, like a bit of domain knowledge that you need oscillations, you need some kind of structure to learn uh, with a simpler reward. And finally, some important scientific question is now that we have this, what are which sensory information is important to achieve good good behavior? And and a conclusion of our work is it looks like limb contact is necessary and sufficient to have fairly good behavior. So we we took a bit the, the, the sensory pathways and we explored a bit systematically what could we remove and, and not. And we, uh, the ones that seem really necessary and sufficient was the limb loading, how much you're loading the limb. And here is an example of a gate that's not perfect it's not as good as when you have the full sensory information, but surprisingly good enough to to do fairly robust locomotion. But if you remove the link loading locomotion, then then it falls. You don't have good locomotion anymore. That's why it's necessary and sufficient. All right. So so uh, to conclude this part, uh, it looks like. Uh, having uh, this CPG dynamics in the loop makes learning not faster, but makes it much simpler to design a reward function. And we have nice properties that things are surprisingly robust for the transfer from simulation to real. We have for free uh, modulation of speed, body height, and swing um, yeah, ground clearance. We have robust locomotion, and, and we have a way of exploring a bit to see which sensing is important. And we found that the proper, the loading, the limb loading seems to be uh, the most important. And, and this is now, uh, now we adding vision and, and we want to see how do animals anticipate. So most of the things we have done so far were kind of reactive, not looking in the future, but now uh, obviously animals have vision and then you need some kind of internal models to be able to predict what happens. And here we're finding that the same framework is, is super good to, to find ways of using the CPGs to have anticipation. And uh, we have a few papers coming out or, and, or just one came out here looking at that. Okay, so to summarize what I, what I hope I showed to you in terms of neuroscience is uh, that the nervous system combines beautifully multi-layers of both feed forward and feedback uh, control. 
it's likely that the respective role have changed during evolution with lower vertebrates being more CPG driven, high vertebrates more, um, more sensory driven. Um, there are other things that are important that I didn't have time to cover, like size, um, uh, the frequency, high or low frequency, or even the time needed for animals to become, become mature. I, I don't have time to cover that, but you, you find it in the paper and, and in this drawing. And interestingly, I think, as mentioned, for, for the human locomotion, there seem to be a, a possibly gradient of from proximal to distal uh, importance um, between feed for and feedback control in mammalian limbs. And for sure, uh, the spinal cord uh, offers a good substrate for learning uh, and simplifies uh, the reward design, as, as mentioned before. Now, uh, let me check time. Maybe very in five minutes, uh, very rapidly. Um, I just want to show this final project, which is a quite exciting one we did uh, a few years back uh, on, on paleontology. Um, and here we were approached by John Yakatura, who, who works on fossils. And he had studied this uh, very well preserved fossil of Orobates, which is an early tetrapod in between amphibians and reptiles. And what was exciting is they had not only found the morphology of that animal, but also the footprints. And it's kind of a unique way of having a very well prefers, preserved morphology to start in a quantitative way exploring what was the gait to walk in these exact footprints. Okay, so uh, let me go a bit fast. What we did is, first of all, characterize the space of possible gates by looking at uh, uh, modern animals. Um, and then starting to uh, uh, describe a bit the, the, the space of possible gates, like uh, the, the body height is one criteria, how much you use the spine bending is another criteria here, and how much, uh, which degrees of freedom in the limbs are used, more the first degree of freedom than the second one. And that you can then create a 3D space, as you see here, where you can populate existing animals. And the idea was to see where does the orobatis fit um, where does the fossil live? Which gates could it have used in this space? And there we came in to make simulations and robots that match as well as possible the fossil. One thing we did was to, to use inverse kinematics controllers to explore the space of possible gates. Uh, the, all the gates that could have the morphology and walk in the footprint. And that could, uh, and then we explored a bit uh, how close to the ground could you be, how high could you be, how much to use the spine bending versus no spending or a lot of spine bending, and how much to use the first degree of freedom here called humeral ret retraction, or the, the next one, which is the long axis rotation. And, and here what we found is that in this space of possible gates, uh, we could have used, in fact, many gates. So which is not surprising. It's a hyper redundant system. So the Orobates could really have uh, filled a big space of that, uh, that space, a big volume of that space, because it's, it could have used many, many different gates. But now what was interesting is we could then define matrix and we could quantify the likelihood of these gates. Like we could look at energy consumption, we could look at balance, we could look at how accurate uh, are our controllers to walk in the footprints. And once you do that, and if you use a, a zooming in process, we could zoom in into the most likely gates, which are these points here. And we could therefore kind of uh, hypothesize that the, the gate is very similar to the caiman, which is a quite modern animal. So to summarize, the orbiters could have used many different gates. But if we zoom into the most likely one, uh, we believe it was very similar to the Cayman, which is a quite erect, a quite modern, let's say, gate. And this is then the gate that we, we think uh, was most likely or among the most likely used by the Orobates. And uh, now if we look at from the top with the robot at the bottom here, the simulation at the top here, and with some uh, computer graphics to leave footprints, we could really match the footprints that were recorded given the morphology. So a quite exciting way of reactivating an extinct uh, animal. And finally, what we did is, is uh, move the bones um, and, and uh, really have the bones 
implement the same gate that we implemented on, on the robot. Okay, so sorry, sorry, it was a bit fast, but uh, for me it was a very exciting project to use robots to explore quantitatively uh, paleontolo paleontological questions and, and really have kind of a new way, quantitative way of doing paleontology. All right, I think I've spoken enough. So thank you, thanks a lot for your attention. These are I would like to thank this, the people uh, who worked with me, the team, the funding. And maybe I just want to advertise a simulation package that we have developed here called Farms um, that you might want to play with if you if you want to implement some of the models or play with some of the models we, we're developing. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to take questions, if any. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, the very nice talk. Um, so I think we have a few minutes for questions. So let's see. The, um, I do have some questions, uh, but if there is someone else who wants to go first, uh, either from um, the people online or there in the room, in the room you can pass around the microphone. All right. Meanwhile, they get organized. Maybe I, st I start with a question that I had. So, yeah. so back to um, the example of the lamprey, the one where you show that you know you can create you know the synchronization among the various oscillators with just a simple um, sensory feedback, and then and then you go into seeing the trade-offs between um, you know various modalities, but just uh, sticking to the sensory feedback. So. <clears throat> So there you are just looking at the pressure difference on the two sides of the single module, right? Yeah. Um, have you, what happens if you, uh, you know, once once they get synchronized and a swimming gate emerges and you start picking up speed, if you switch off entirely the, the, the feedback uh, and let just the hydrodynamics kind of keep in check the coordination, does that work or the, or the, or the robot miserably fail after some time yeah that's a good question we uh, to be honest we never tried so it's a it's an interesting question my prediction would be um I, I think you could then swim quite long because you you uh if there's no our oscillators don't have noise so we don't introduce noise at the computer we don't do noise so so they would be phase locked because they they have been phase locked thanks to sensory feedback so you would start having an open loop pattern that that I think would drive the robot very well, and they will not desynchronize because they, there's no noise in the system. So I, I would my prediction would be that you could do well quite long, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I, we, it's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, okay. So but then uh, that raises a second question very very quickly. So <clears throat> so let's say if you have an elastic body i mean there's there's you have uh, you know actuators in between the joints i, I imagine there but um, uh, without even sensory feedback just uh, imagine that you similar to the example that you had with the dead trout there you have a flow and then the flow structure interaction generates an instability that you generate the gate is if you have an initial flow maybe maybe it's low maybe not too low not too you know not a very high reynolds number and you have no feedbacks, but uh, but you let just the mechanics kind of bring in sync the oscillator. Do you think uh, um, you would get to um, a gate similar or different, or maybe no gate at all? Yeah, yeah. Well, th these are perfect questions because we're exactly addressing this question now. So, so because my my prediction would be that the feedback loops that we're exploring are uh, useful for exactly maybe doing frequency locking into uh, uh, the, these vortices. Especially if you swim behind another another person, mm -hmm. and and we also hope we also hoping that if we don't have the feedback, that just the mechanics themselves can benefit from this. But here, to be honest, our robots are have a bit too much damping, so they have a lot of uh, internal friction. Uh, I can maybe just show one video because we simulate the muscles, so because that's important. We we don't do position control. We we simulate muscles. So let me show you this. Uh, we have simple muscle-like uh, models, and 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 therefore we 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 have a bit of dead trout-like body, but possibly with too much damping. So uh, we I mean we're exactly exploring if we could replicate the dead trout uh, with our robots, but I think we have a bit too much friction. So that mm. that's a bit of a problem. But 
these are very interesting questions because we we explore we want to explore exactly that that type of things. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the damping probably is not gonna. Yeah, it's probably not gonna help. All right, no. okay. So I see there are different um, uh, question in the chat. So maybe I let's there's see. There's one question in the seminar room, and then there's two more that are in the chat. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Please go on. But awesome talk. First off, um, but. Uh, can you scroll back to the graph where it shows the the eel to the salamander and how it's changing the proportion of uh, the different types of control? Yes, this. Yep. yep. Um, looking at this reminded me of uh, something I was reading on uh, octopus and uh, similar um, animals where they have a lot of their sensory system distributed throughout their arms. And I was wondering, has any research been done to look uh, in that direction to see how uh, similar techniques can use be analyzed their motions and uh, how they operate. Yeah, that's a super good question because, like, yeah, the octopus is completely amazing because it has like uh, every tentacle has its own brain. Um, and uh, to be honest, I, I my prediction uh, would be that you have also a nice combination of feed forward and feedback control distributed within every tentacle. Um, but I don't know enough of the control circuits. I think, Mattia, you, you know much more about the octopus than I do. You, you might have the answer to that question. Yeah, no, I don't necessarily have the answer. I mean, it's, it's for sure more complex than, than a lamprey. They have, uh, they have uh, you know, distributed, um, you know, this kind of mini brain or ganglia that regulate and, and control all of the suckers and all of the sensing over there. But it's uh, very much unknown what the what the neurobiology of the octopus of the octopus mm -hmm. is. So we have been doing some modeling, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. much of it is speculative. Mm -hmm. But do you agree? I, I would have to say uh, this hypothesis that maybe more proximally you are feed for driven, and the more distally you might be more sensory driven because you that's where you have the interaction with the environment. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I would not that's be surprised possible. that. Not, yeah, that's that that's that, possible. Yeah. I mean, of course, um, I mean, you know, the 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 proximal part is also much thicker, much uh, you know, it, it requires a little bit more, um, um, you know, probably effort to to coordinate. But um, the octopus can you know has this muscle that innervate uh, the whole system. So it's hard to say that the, the proximal part is necessarily uh, more sensory driven than than not, because even this the the last part can do pretty amazing uh, uh, manipulation. So, um, yeah, who knows? Yeah, but good question. Yeah. I don't know if you can read them directly. Oh yeah, I can read them directly. So, um, hold on. So I see one from Han Shang. He said, "Nice talk. Uh, a quick question on the CPG coupling part. There are some coupling parameters W I J in the equation. Are they predefined or learned? And is there any property that the W I J satisfy or need to satisfy?" Uh, yeah, yeah, very good question. So let maybe take uh, something like here. Uh, here, um, now, so to answer rapidly, we 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 don't learn them. We in this in this work, we can set them by hand, and uh, there's interesting trade-off. It's fairly simple, in fact. So if you set the weights to high values, you start to have very tight coupling. And you have very short transients, but then it's very hard for the sensory feedback to do any role on this because you you kind of really impose you impose uh, um, uh, uh, coupling strengths. So in, in my previous modeling, the coupling strengths in the salamander were quite strong, and now I realize uh, that we probably were too strong, and and that fairly weak coupling is sufficient to have like a bit uh, a fairly short transient, and then the feedback can reinforce that thing. So. These days, we realize that um, they don't need to be so high. But in, in this simple case, fairly simple to tune by hand, and, and it's just a trade-off between how much yeah, you're more imposing the CPG gate versus how much you do the, the sensory gate. So uh, I hope that answers the, the question, yeah. In, in, in Obviously, in the human model, there we have many more parameters, many more things. There we, we cannot do this kind of parameter sweeps. We, we need to use learning because there uh, things are more complicated. All right. Thanks.
Uh, so there is one more question. Um, um, thank you for the nice talk. Would you please elaborate a little bit more on why learning through CPGs is not faster than learning in joint angle space? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, my, 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 that I, I like somebody to tell me that because uh, that's I, to be honest, I was dreaming and hoping to show uh, like a little horse being able to locomote in half an hour. Uh, you know, all, all the prey animals, they are super fast at doing locomotion. So in half an hour, you do impressive locomotion. And that means the, 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 there's something encapsulated in the CPG or the spinal cord networks in general that's already ready to locomote and very fine, a little tuning is sufficient to go to do locomotion. Humans need many more months and months to train as kids. Uh, so their learning is, is slower. But my hope was to show that the CPGs would be ready to do very fast learning, a bit like when we did optimization on the human locomotion, that few generations were sufficient. But surprisingly, the deep reinforcement learning framework was so good that, that it was learning fast, even in joint position. And it's still a bit of a surprise to me uh, and a bit of uh, disappointment. But uh, so, yeah, I don't have the right answer yet. I, I was really hoping the learning would be faster. But, but okay, so you say that it's not faster, but you know, one can argue that, okay, in GPU time, right? Once the problem is set up, maybe the convergence is similar, but in human time, <laughs> figuring out how to set up that problem, that's a big difference, right? Uh, instead of having a student trying and trying so many different cost functions and tuning and so on, you set up something simple and intuitive and it goes. Yeah, so there yeah. Is, there is at least that in that regard is is faster. That 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 is true. Yeah, yeah, and and I would say also uh, compared to the biped locomotion where learning was very fast, I think the quadruped problem is maybe not that complicated. So so quadrupeds are are fairly stable, are much more stable mm -hmm. obviously than biped locomotion. So uh, I think that's also part of the role where where as you see uh, the the gates the gates that were learned very fast by by uh, deep reinforcement learning were not not nice they were kind of pathological gates mm. they had a very high score but it's just because it's a quadruped that would not work well on a biped so i mm. think that's also part of the answer all right i think uh, we have uh, if unless there is a one last question perhaps from the audience if not Greg, is there any more question? Once, no, we're done here. Thanks. No. All right. Okay. So I think well, we are perfectly on time, exactly 4 p.m., 11 p.m. over there. Uh, and so, well, thanks again for, for the great talk. Uh, I particularly enjoyed and, and I'm pretty sure that everyone in the audience did too. And, um, and uh, well, thanks again for, for, uh, uh, you know, for presenting, being our first distinguished lecturer here. And we hope to see you in person uh, soon at the first possible occasion over here. We would love to see you, to show you around what, what the Mind in Vitro project is doing. And there are many other people that uh, will be interested in talking to you. All right. Okay. So we can, uh, we can uh, thank again our speaker from yeah. uh, the room and virtually. Yeah. And, thank you uh, so much. Thank you. Yeah, and, and really sorry that I could not be there in person, but oh, no, no uh, problem, it was great no problem. to, to uh, interact and I, I'm sure I'll come for a visit and uh, I'm happy to maybe have Zoom chats, uh, or Zoom discussions next week. And thank you so much for inviting me. It was also very exciting to hear the, all the good questions from you, your side. Thanks sure. a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you. And for everyone there, there is pizza now. <laughs> Ah, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. See you. Take care. Yeah. See you, uh, Matthias. See you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.